Hello everybody, my name is Ray. Welcome to the Evangelical Dark Web. Yes, I got a haircut for the first time in like 11 months. And, you know, I gotta say, I don't mind getting my hair cut. I just don't like going somewhere to do it. So that happened this weekend. And, yeah, I feel, look good, feel good, right? So today we're going to be talking about the Gospel Coalition and their endorsement of vaccine passports in the church. It's basically an endorsement of it. Uh, this comes from their Australian branch down under where, you know, just simping for the government is just par for the course in Australia and the Canadian editions of the Gospel Coalition. So, you know, uh, they like being of the world and in the world, that's for sure. So let's read Megan Best's article. It was published a few days ago, and it begins with a disclaimer saying, um, you know, Megan Best is a professional bioethicist, whatever that is, and a valuable contributor to the website. Uh, and it's not necessarily the opinion of TGC. And they say they have a, uh, an article on a different perspective. And if you look at this article, this article is not very good as far as um, being in opposition to uh, vaccine passports as an issue. It's very weak. It's basically saying um, you can't argue super strongly against vaccine passports. It's not that bad. That's basically what that ar argument in that article is. It's basically... Uh, just a squish argument, and it's unacceptable. It's an unacceptable um, opposition. It's an un unacceptable uh, objection. It's too weak. It's too weak. It's basically the same thing as J John Piper criticizing uh, critical race theory for being uh, materialistic. That is an inadequate critique. And it basically wants to pretend that Australia is not a police state in one of the and really, Australia is one of the most oppressive countries in the world as it stands right now. Sure, North Korea is worse, but not many other countries are worse than Australia at the moment. So, uh, and again, this is an article that surely shows that the Gospel Coalition is corrupt to the core. So, we're going to skip the first few sections and because we don't need an explainer on what a vaccine is. And we don't really need to go through their data on the vaccine, which isn't really true. So let's just skip that and get to the moral and biblical arguments in this uh, article. So let's just skip to that. In a liberal society, restrictions imposed by the state on an individual liber individual's liberty are justified, hold on, only to prevent harm to others rather than harm to ourselves. Unvaccinated individuals present a risk to society by being more likely to get infected and thereby infect others, possibly overburdening the health system and preventing others from accessing care. Okay, that again, that, that's complete crap. That That is not showing up in the data. Uh, let's go back to the first claim. Restrictions imposed on a state by an individual are justified to only prevent harm to others rather than ourselves. I don't really agree with that because the potential to harm other people is no real reason to restrict liberty. That is a very squishy, pliable reason to impose new restrictions on other people. You know, we just got to go, and I'm not making a theonomous argument, but I think God's law covers what things that should be crimes and things that are just sins that don't necessarily need to be enforced by the state. I think God's law does a good job at saying, you know, thievery is sin. Therefore, you know, the state should punish that. I think you can make that argument from the Bible. That's not a restriction on an individual's liberty. And in, a restriction on an individual liberty is something like lockdowns, mask mandates. Those are restrictions on an individual's liberty. And they don't do any of the latter claims that she makes and they aren't justified either. So just like we can argue that the, the, the Patriot Act wasn't really a justified response to 9-11, especially as it doesn't even meet these claims, it doesn't prevent harm to others. Uh, it doesn't really prevent harm to others. It really just fed a fear that Americans had post 9-11. So uh, 
and it currently is a concern for NSW. In an attempt to achieve herd immunity, whoa, that's a dirty word, incentives and disincentives for vaccination against COVID-19 are being have been widely discussed. Why does there need to be a citation for that claim? One idea that has been proposed is a system of vaccine passports similar to those that have been introduced in many countries. The idea behind a vaccine passport is that you cannot justify a restriction of a vaccinated person's liberty as they do not pose a significant harm to others. Again, that's not really true, but neither does an unvaccinated person. So she's arguing that if you're unvaccinated, you are a threat. That's what she's arguing here. For Christians, a major concern has been raised by the introduction of vaccine passports is the question of whether double vaccination should be a requirement for attendance at a church meeting. Double vaccination? Really? Double? How about any? Any? Again, this is not the real, this is a straw, like a straw man. She's pushing the Overton window in her direction to say that this is really what the opposition's saying. It's like, no, you're not representing the true opposition. This is a straw man that she's putting up and not necessarily to knock it down easy, which is traditionally what a straw man is, but it's not the accurate position of the opposition to vaccine lockdowns and in the church. It's not the adequate opposition. A duty to gather. A biblical text frequently cited in connection with this discussion is the exhortation of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. As, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And she, again, she's trying to neuter this verse. Several observations about these verses should be born out of a mind when we consider um, the relevant the relevance to the present discussion. No, hold on, hold on. What these verses mean is that we should not use lockdowns as an excuse to not gather. That is called sin. That is called unfaithfulness. That is unfaithfulness. This. Um, she's basically, Megan Best is basically an adulteress. And I mean that in the James 4, 4 sense, not that she's cheated on her husband or anything like that, but she is trying to get the church to cheat on God with a false religion that I've been calling the branch Covidian cult. That is, it is a cult and we need to recognize that it is a cult, especially in Australia, Australia, which is a secular, very post-Christian nation. And you see how they went hard on branch covidianism they went hard on it and all these commonwealth nations did and america is one of the only um uh english common law nations that is pushing back and really as far as western nations go america is like the only nation that's really pushing back uh the eastern Bloc, the eastern europe's is they're hardcore about they're actually some of the freest nations on earth as it relates to this issue and apparently they also have very low um, uh, case rates at the moment and they're also very low on the vaccination scale that was a funny observation uh, in reference to travel restrictions all right several uh, okay the situation been being addressed in the letter of hebrews is not one which the readers have found themselves Temporarily, temporarily prevented from holding large face-to-face -face gatherings. It is not a challenge to believers who are conscientiously minimizing health risk by complying with public health order. It is the believers that have grown slack in their care for others and shrinking back from publicly identifying with Christ and his people. That is exactly what you did during lockdowns. You totally uh, slunk back from identifying with Christ and his people. That's what lockdowns were all about. That is why these governments wanted to shut down churches because they w wanted you to violate uh, these verses. They wanted you to violate biblical commands. They wanted to see how serious these Christians were about their faith. And it turns out many of them, most of them, weren't very serious at all. That's why they stopped gathering. That's why they stopped gathering for, you know, with very little information uh, to prove that they should stop gathering. There, again, on March 16th, 2020, there was not enough evidence to impose lockdowns. And no, it was not a good cautionary measure at the time. There's no reason to believe that at the time. 
uh, you were just afraid. Stop justifying your fear over a year and a half later. No, you are wrong. This was sin from the start. They were deceived into sinning, and then they later continued to defy God's commandment to not neglect the gathering. These people neglected the gathering of the saints, and you see that in the data. These A lot of churches are having trouble trying to get people back. Why? Because they encourage people to violate this commandment, and they have no logical reason to bring people back. They have no logical reason to, to justify their own importance. They basically committed an organizational suicide. Obviously, God's church is uh, too important to not gather. The mission is too important. There are providential interruptions. There are providential interruptions. Like a hurricane is going to wipe out your town. That is a providential interruption to worship. Uh, You being sick and then staying home is, again, a providential interruption to worship. That is fine. We understand that as Christians. You fearing that you could get sick by showing up in a place, that's that's not a providential interruption. It's not. Uh, You being told temporarily that you can't gather to worship because the government is getting its lockdown fetish on? Nope, that is not a temporary uh, providential justification to not meet. In fact, we see this in the book of Daniel uh, when there, when everyone is commanded, not just the Jews who are worshiping uh, Yahweh, everyone was commanded that they could not worship any of their gods. They had to worship one God, and it was a false god for 30 days. That was temporary. Now, Did they have providential justification to not worship God to follow that edict? No, they did not. So, obviously, we got to think above an elementary level, and that's not what the Gospel Coalition is not here for. They are here to dumb you down. They want to dumb down the church. And that's why I like exposing them, because this can be a good object lesson for biblical edification of the real church, not the gospel coalition types. Uh, The reference to meeting together in verse 25 is grammatically subordinate to the primary exhortation uh, in verse 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Okay, so basically the argument here is going to be that locking down is good deeds and loving your neighbor. And it's not. It's not. Uh, We can look at the mental health statistics that show that lockdowns killed. Lockdowns killed people. And if you supported lockdowns at the time, you supported policies that ended up killing people. And you need to repent of that. You need to repent of calling evil good. You need to repent of calling evil good. And that is what... The, this article is doing. It's calling evil good. It's calling evil policies good. And we need to repent of that collectively because that was wicked. And it did not spur one another. How can you spur one another if you're not seeing them? I get that I try via YouTube to spur on believers, but I am not a local church. A local church. I am part of the church. And, you know, church has many members with you know many different functions. I am part of the church, and this is something I do for the love of the church. But as far as the partaking of ordinances, the preaching on Sunday, that that type of stuff, the fellowship, I can't provide you the same fellowship that a local church can. I have limitations on how much I can spur one another. And basically, you imposed those same limitations on the local church and on believers. That is evil. That is evil. You basically said that people could not exercise their spiritual gifts. That is, how do you spur one another during lockdowns? You cannot. You cannot. Now, wicked preachers like um, Rick Warren, who we've covered in depth lately in, in the month of September, basically argued in favor of using small groups as a means to substitute the function of a local church. And again, I believe small groups can, you know, you know, small groups are often how church plants start as, but mo- small groups are not designed to function as a local church. 
and placing the burden of functioning as a local church on a small group is unbiblical. It is not biblical ecclesiology. So uh, let's move on. The kind of meeting together that the verse encourages as a vehicle for mutual encouragement does not necessarily require large weekly extended indoor gatherings. There are other ways in which we can fulfill this ex- this, the exhortation of this verse. Like what? And did they work? This is where you need to point out an alternative and did it work? And the data shows it did not. It didn't work and it wasn't necessary. It also wasn't necessary. Lockdowns killed people. They killed people. They killed economies. They killed livelihoods. They killed people. Do not call evil good. And again, the burden of proof is on her. And maybe there's a footnote here. And it seems to be... uh, Nevertheless, it is true that face-to-face presence with other believers is basic to how Christian life is normally to be lived. And Christians who are physically separated from, from one another will long to gather in person as soon as the circumstances that prevent it fr- can be overcome. They could always have been overcome if they actually really cared. In our current context, this gives us, as Christians, a further motivation to embrace the opportunity of vaccination. Oh, wow, there we go. If that will help create the conditions under which such gatherings will be safe and legal. Wow. So the local church needs to beg and grovel at Caesar in order to meet. That is what she's saying. That is also unbiblical ecclesiology. Christ is head of the church, not Caesar. The legality of church um, gatherings is already determined by scripture. It was not legal for churches to gather pretty much under the persecution of the church. That pretty much meant that church gatherings were illegal. And it does not matter why they were illegal. It doesn't matter why they were illegal. People are evil. Total depravity is a real thing. They can say it's about public health measures. They can say it's about public safety. But that doesn't mean in their hearts it truly is what it is. People are totally depraved. Their good intentions really don't matter and probably don't exist. The the real intention of locking down church gatherings was to harm the church. These people are under the influence of Satan because they were not under the influence of Satan. God. They were not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And there is a dichotomy there. If you're not on team Jesus, you're on team Satan. And I urge you to repent and come to Christ because you do not want to be on team Satan. That ends in a fiery pit. Do not go into a fiery pit. Do not go, do not go there. I'm a little fiery myself today because... I find I found myself becoming an apologetics ministry against the branch Covidian cult. And this is a cult. This is a cult. We have to grovel at the seat of Caesar, according to Megan Best, in order to gather? No. Christ is head of the church. Christ is head of the church. Conscientious objections. Sorry, my pronunciation gets a little rough. Sometimes for a small number of vaccine hesitant Christians, the ob- objection that the vaccine is a conscientious is a conscientious one arising from the fact that the process of developing some vaccines involves the use of f- cell lines derived from human fetuses electively, ab- electively, really aborted decades ago. The use of fetal cell lines in pharmaceutical research is certainly a matter that ought to be of a concern for Christians. Not, none, nevertheless, there are good reasons why Christians who place a high value on human life would support, should support rather than oppose the use of vac- vaccines currently available for COVID-19, none of which contain fetal cell tissue or contribute in any way to the destruction of fetuses in our own time. Now, I don't think this really matters here nor there because I don't think you can make an argument that taking a vaccine derived from this technology is necessarily sinful. I think the larger issue at play is one, I don't think certain things work. And uh, two, I 
do not, the government does not have the right to compel someone to take a certain medicine. Uh, that again, that falls sphere sovereignty. I've already talked about the distinction between Christ and Caesar, or ecclesiastical authority and uh, civil authority, and how civil authority does not have ecclesiastical authority. That is unbiblical. And apparently, so many in the church don't know that. They don't know church history, especially in the Protestant church where we had to deal with a lot of these issues, especially in American history. If you look at the Vindication of the Churches of New England, written by John Wise, basically dealt with this same issue in the um, early 1700s, late 1600s in, again, New England. So, you know, these issues aren't new in church history. And the doctrine of lesser ma magistrates was a faith creedal statement generated in response to uh, tyrannical governments. This isn't new in Christian history. And again, the government doesn't have the right to compel me to take something that I believe is a talus to a cult. This is a cult. It's not about safety. It's not about my health. It's about a cult. It's about submitting to a cult. It's about being bullied into complying with a cult. That's how I feel about the issue. I, uh, and I know some of you may disagree with the whole uh, abortion fetal cell lines, but I think what I said to me is more important. And that's where my conscience lines up on the issue. Uh, not so much a human fetuses issue. And I, I get that if you are more hung up on that issue than what I just said, that's perfectly acceptable. We are free to disagree on what the most important objection is. We're free to disagree on that as believers. And I won't um, uh, condemn you for that. So uh, non-conscientious objections. Other Christians uh, resist, resist vaccination for very variety of other reasons, including anxiety about vaccines, extremely rare side effects, or skepticism about expert opinion, government policies, or motivations of the pharmaceutical industry. Objections of this nation, nature may be firmly held, but in most case, cases are not the sort of thing that should be rightly described as a matter of conscience. Uh, no, I raise you Romans 14, which is a verse that I believe is later referenced in this article as um, your conscientious objection on these grounds. Romans 13 is a conscientious objection on these grounds that if you violate your conscience, you very well could be sinning. So let's move on because, again, I don't think we need to go into a whole theological dis discussion yet where I do think she goes to Romans 14 here, so we can uh, discuss that more in depth later on. Uh Questions for Christian leaders and congregations in the COVID-19 era. Churches will be aiming to be inclusive. Whew, that's a bad word to be using. Uh, respectful of conscientious uh, convictions and safe for all those who attend. Uh, given the current state of our knowledge about the vaccine and assuming levels of community transmission and hospitalization that are within capacity of our health system, which was never a real issue. Let's be real about that. Italy just sucks. It is reasonable to anticipate that there will soon be a time when opening our churches to those who are double vaccinated will be problematic because they're not triple vaccinated, duh. Or the children in our church communities who are too young to be vaccinated. Uh, what about those who object to vaccination for conscientious reasons? or because they distrust the experts, the authorities, or the pharmaceutical industry. Those are conscientious reasons. That, that's redundant. Those are conscientious reasons. And what about the frail and sick members of our church family for whom infection still poses a serious risk, even after vaccination? I, again, the vaccine doesn't really prevent you from getting COVID-19. It doesn't prevent you from getting it. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean it doesn't help. Doesn't mean it doesn't make it worse. It just doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't prevent you from enduring a battle. It's like a flu vaccine. Uh, what biblical principles apply as we seek to address questions such as these? Love our neighbors. First of all, love your neighbor 
as yourself. Key distinction there. It's not love your neighbor as you want me to love your neighbor or my neighbor. It's I love my neighbor as I love myself. It is basically using self-love as the standard of which you love other people and comply with God's law. God's law, because there's, there's very few instances where you can actually sin against yourself. Sexual sins are one of those instances where the Bible says you sin against your own body. Uh, and But otherwise, you're either sinning against God or you're sinning against your neighbor. So loving your neighbor as yourself, first of all, means you don't sin against your neighbor and point to God's law that says we need to take a certain medication in order to love our neighbor. It does not exist. It's also love your neighbor as yourself, as Mark 12, 31 clearly states as yourself. It clearly states that as part of the clause of the commandment. It clearly states that. So... You don't have an argument here. You don't. If I don't believe that masking my child is loving my neighbor, then uh, guess what I'm not going to do? If I don't believe that taking a vaccine is loving my neighbor, guess what I'm not going to do? You don't get to determine what loving my neighbor is. You don't have that authority. You're not God. And the people that claim that are teaching falsely they are uh, that is false teaching that is legalism because they are adding to the law of God and when you add to the law of God you are basically making the argument that people who are not obeying your law that you added to God are in sin that is again that that goes down into legalism that's what that is and that is unacceptable we can't have that so moving on obey your our leaders Romans 13, 1 through 7 is the full passage. Uh, Let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted from or by God. Uh, Again, Romans 13 lays out the role of government is to bear the sword uh, in not in vain against evil, is to bear the sword of evil or bear the sword against evil as God's avenging messenger on earth. It is meant to punish evil. It is also meant to reward good. Where do vaccines fall under either of those two categories of punishing evil and rewarding good? Where do vaccines line up on that? Where does public health line up on that? Nowhere. Nowhere at all. So... Again, not a real argument. And again, back to the whole thing about sphere sovereignty. Uh, Can the government mandate that I can't educate my kids? No, because that's clearly within the authority of the family. Uh, Can the government mandate that church is locked down? No, because that's clearly in the authority of ecclesiology and the ecclesiastical bodies. That's where that authority lies. Um, Can the government mandate that I uh, give up my personal property. And by that, I mean like not real property, which is, you know, like land, like eminent domain and stuff like that. Uh, No, they can't. They can't mandate that I give up my gold. Like, you know, the American government did during Roosevelt's time. They mandated that people gave up, give up their gold. The government doesn't have that authority. That, that's an evil policy. And the same thing with gun control, if we want to point to Australia as an example. Uh, they don't have that authority. So we need to recognize fierce sovereignty. And again, that's laid out in the Doctrine of Lesser Magistrates. I recommend you check that out. Uh, moving on, because this is getting long. Uh, respect for the conscience of others. Let me pull up Romans 13, 14, Romans 14, the principle of conscience. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purposes of passing judgment on his opinions. 
one person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not regarded with contempt, with does not is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge? The servant of the other to his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the Lord he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself and not one of us dies for himself. And if, for if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord of the dead and the living. That is the textbook passage on Christian liberty, this notion that we are free to disagree on our praxis as believers. And it does not, and I, I think she's using this as a uh, place of objection. Um, uh, okay, so, but conscientious conscientious objection usually comes at the cost of some sort of safe usually comes at the cost of some sort of safety of the most vulnerable members of the church and the wider community should not be held hostage to the desires of others to do as they please actually they should because of individual liberty that is a god-given right an inalienable right given to us by our creator so technically they are and they always have been until people wanted to play god with these lockdown measures that is what they were doing when they locked down entire countries and economies they were playing god they thought they had more control over creation than they actually do, and it turns out they had no control over creation. That It's a cult. They believe that they were God. They really did. Uh, you, you see Anthony Fauci. That guy has a God complex. That's why he was testing AIDS medication on um, uh, orphans in New York, and some of these kids died. He has a God complex. Uh, prioritize the weakest and most vulnerable it is in both our duty to the wider public and our care for the congregation with whom we gather. We are to prioritize the needs of the weakest and most vulnerable. This is the case even when, and perhaps especially when, they do not have a loud voice to broadcast their own opinions or and lobby for their rights. Um, again, most vulnerable is very subjective. However, let, let's just... Uh, ass- let, let's just uh, go back to the whole premise that her argument's really failing under. And uh, I don't think she thinks that the jabs work. Because if she did, she wouldn't be writing all these things about how unvaccinated people are dangerous. She wouldn't be writing those if she thought it that um, certain treatments were effective. So she doesn't believe it. How can I get vaccinated if... The people that are arguing for vaccination don't believe in their own vaccination. That's a very get you know you you don't even have a vote of your own confidence. You're, you're giving yourselves a vote of no confidence. Uh, given our responsibility to love our neighbors as ourselves, see how she misquotes scripture so flippantly. That's what these branch covidians have been doing since day one. They've been misquoting scripture since day. one. One, and prioritize the interests of the most vulnerable. There are good and persuasive reasons for us to support and implement a system in which proof of vaccination or medical exemption is a standard requirement for attendance at large indoor gatherings such as church services. But or because the high levels of vaccination that would be required for herd immunity uh, no, natural immunity is still a thing. The interconnections of the world's populations and the um, likely emergence of new variants of concern. How are those new variants created? 
A requirement of this sort may continue to be necessary, may continue to be necessary, so some are already doing it, for some time in order uh, into the future, along with other measures such as ma uh, social distancing, mask, and frequent hand washing. I don't do any of those things. I mean, I frequently wash my hands, but usually when I'm cooking in the kitchen, so don't shame me too much, or use the bathroom, or you know, stuff like that, but... Um, not because I fear that I touched something that was germy like a newborn. <laughs> but this should not mean that we are excluded or we exclude those who have not been vaccinated from fellowship, uh, from the fellowship of the church or from the circle of our ministry. If, re if a regime of vaccine passports is to be with us for some time into the future, then our energy should be expended not, not on fighting against it, but on finding safe, inclusive, and responsible ways to gather and minister within such context. One obvious option would be to advocate for a system that permitted those who remain unvaccinated or incompletely vaccinated to, to produce evidence of being COVID negative as a condition for church attendance. Nope, that's legalism. That is unbiblical. Uh, you are imposing an unbiblical barrier. There's nothing in the Bible. I, I got the Bible in front of me. There's nothing in the Bible about uh, testing negative for COVID in order to attend. There's nothing in the Bible about wearing a mask in order to attend. Those are unbiblical barriers to worship. Uh, if anything, again, that's like requiring believers to be circumcised in order to partake in the ordinances like baptism, like uh, communion. If you're requiring believers to um, participate in your theater, that's what all these measures are. In order to be a part of a local church, you are imposing on biblical mandates. You are in sin. And I encourage you, if you find yourself in that situation, you need to find yourself a church that wants to not compromise to the Branch Covidian cult. Because as we are seeing, everyone who's compromising to the Branch Covidian cult is also compromising to critical theory. They're woke. Generally speaking, they're embracing the revoice movement. Like the circle of woke churches and Branch Covidian churches is increasing, the Venn diagram, I should say, is increasingly becoming one circle. And that's where we're going to end up at the end of this. That's where the slippery slope is leading. That everything, all these apostasies will merge because they're being like the world. And we're going to read uh, John chapter 2. Or first John chapter two, as we close out this article, because we do need to point back to scripture, but we're not we're not at the end of the article yet. We're actually we are at the end of our article. Um, uh, another would be to continue to expand the range of online opportunities for Christian fellowship and online communications, because this is working out so well. And as restrictions on outdoor gatherings continue to be relaxed into the future, another would be to make more of our gatherings both small and large into suitable outdoor spaces again where is the biblical ecclesiology with care creativity no oxford comma and a willingness to pursue the good of others ahead of our own convention convenience and advantage it should be entirely possible for us to practice both our call to minister the gospel to all people and our responsibility to love our neighbors not as ourselves as you know uh, as the Bible says, just love our neighbors and as she wants you to and care for the vulnerable without requiring one of these commitments to trump the others. Actually, if you want to care about other people, you care about their rights. You care about individual liberties because my rights are other people's rights. Individual liberties held by me are also the individual liberties held by my neighbor. And if I oppose individual liberties, I am opposing my neighbor's individual liberties, which I think are more important than their safety. Because again, loving your neighbor as yourself, I care. I want you to care about. I care about your rights more than I care about your safety, and I care about. And I want you to care about my rights more than you care about my safety. That's loving your neighbor as yourself, as it is literally written. Now, again, this does go back to the part where loving your neighbor as yourself really is a fulfill is asking you to fulfill God's law as it relates to loving and not sin sinning against your neighbor. But I do think there's also a positive affirmation of what you should be doing as a believer, because that is a standard to live by. 
Now, it is also the law. So loving God and loving your neighbor can't save you because that's a summary of the law. And I, I went through one article, I believe it was Gospel Coalition or was it Christianity Today, uh, by a gun control advocate that was basically that basically said that that was the gospel. That is not the gospel. Now, let's read uh, 1 John chapter 2. Uh, Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but one does the will of one the one who does the will of the father lives forever children it is the last hour ju- and just as you heard that the an- that antichrist is coming even now many antichrists have appeared from this we know that it is the last hour they went out from us that but they were not really of us for if they had been of us they would have remained with us but they went out so that it would be shown that they that they all are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. He who... Who is the liar but the one that denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and of the Father. I wanted to read that last part because there is, that shows the gospel in the last part there. Um, if you have the Son, if you have Jesus, you have the Father. You have access to God the Father, and who is a righteous judge. And if you believe in these branch Covidian lies, again, the Gospel Coalition was sent from the church, but they were never of the church. This is, this is an evil institution, and its writers are wicked. Uh, this Megan Best is advocating legalism. She is advocating wicked ecclesio- ecclesiology, and she fancies herself as a bioethicist, but she does not seem to understand biology or ethics, which is sad. But I, I've gone on 40 plus minutes. So I think it's time to conclude. Um, Let me know what you think about what I think, what you think about um, the Gospel Coalition advocating vaccine passports, basically, uh, or other legalist measures to basically impose, they want, she wants the church to impose tyranny on Christians, on believers, and that's unbiblical. She wants the church to turn away those who do not want the vaccine and are not saved. She wants the church to turn away those people instead of ministering to them. And no, meeting their physical vaccination status is not ministering to anyone. So that's all I got to say about that. If you like the Evangelical Dark Web, Subscribe to the channel and like the video also. This video is not going to get much love from the YouTube algorithm, so I would appreciate the love. And if you really like the Evangelical Dark Web, you should become a subscriber over at evangelicaldarkweb.org slash join. You can support the Evangelical Dark Web in that way as well. Uh, My name's Ray again. Have a blessed day, and I will catch you on the next one.